everybody, welcome to our broadcast today. And we have Craig Frazier. And Craig, Craig has been an illustrating designer since, get a load of this, 1978. And he's been illustrating uh, as long as the school's been around. And so his work is recognized internationally for its wit, as you will see today, the optimism and simplicity that he brings forward. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Times and publications like Fortune, uh, Bloomberg's Business Week, uh, Harvard Business Review, The Wall Street Journal, to name a few. And he has corporate clients um, as Adobe, um, American Express, Boeing, Chevrolet, uh, Deloitte, MasterCard, Mohawk Papers, Navigant, uh, the Royal Mail Service, U.S. Postal Service. And um, maybe he'll talk about his stamps with you today a little. And United Airlines, he's... Um, um, he did the he did the love stamp that has become so famous, and uh, and he did the commemorative scouting stamps also very famous. He's published a 176 page mono, monograph titled "The Illustrated Voice," and he's also um, an author and he's illustrated 12 children's books, and and he's a friend of the school, and we cannot wait to hear what he has to share with you today about sketching the bones of creativity. So Craig, take it over. Uh, good evening, I guess. It's good afternoon here. Good evening for most of you. Uh, coming to you live from sunny and smoky California. Not too smoky here. Parts of California are though. And we apologize for any smoke that comes your way. Uh, it's a bad scene in Northern California, but it's nice where I am. Uh, Welcome. Hank and I have talked, what is it, for 20 years, Hank, since I've known you, um, about design, and we keep talking about design, and we keep circling back to one of the central topics, and I, and I guess it's because it might be a little bit frustrating for, for Hank, is, is this idea that, that we're supposed to, that we need to sketch for design. And um, I don't have any trouble talking about it because I do it all the time and I, and I, and I believe in it. And, and so we're gonna spend about an hour talking about it today. And, you know, I have one goal. I really, really wanna change the way all of you work. And I, and, I, and, I, and I believe that at the end of this, this will, this will change the arc in the way you work in your career by a degree, at least. Because the, the, the issue around sketching is that, that so many of us are afraid to do it and we have trouble doing it. And so consequently, we don't practice it. And so consequently, we don't make it part of our discipline and we don't integrate it into our design process. And something gets left behind. And I have been fortunate enough to always sketch in my practice. And I now sketch more than I used to sketch. And I know the difference. Now, I want you to, to excuse me, if you will, because, uh, because I'm an illustrator and I don't want you to think, well, he's an illustrator, that's why he can sketch. I was sketching long before I was an illustrator. I started sketching when I was a designer, which was 20 years into my career, which is 22 years ago before I was an illustrator. And it's integral to illustration. There's no question because we're, it's, a drawing, it's a drawing product that I'm delivering, but it's, it's really critical for design as well. And it's about design thinking. And the, the struggle I think so many of us have around illustrating or around sketching is that we don't think we draw very well. And what I want to talk to you about and I want to show you today is ways to think about sketching that will free you up from the anxiety around what does that sketch look like and is it a good drawing or not? And teach you how to look at it as a tool to to find out what's in our imagination, to find out what the possibilities are. So I'm gonna do all that, but I'm gonna share my screen with you. I'm gonna walk through some projects and I'm gonna show you some sketches. I'm gonna show you that all sketches are not the same. There, there are many bad sketches and there are many good sketches. And, 
and 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 we're going to talk about how to sort of parse those out and how to how to get to the root of a problem um, by sketching. So let me share my screen. Okay, let me pull you all up to the top here. All right, can everybody see that okay? I don't hear anybody, I guess they're all muted. Um, I call it the bones of design because, you know, I think it's a, it's it's like an infrastructure. It's and it's it's fundamental and it's foundational to design. And if we begin to think about it that way, then we start to understand its necessity and we start to understand its purpose. So, I keep lots of sketchbooks. I keep probably two or three going at one point in time, and I I make it part of my daily practice, not my design practice, my living practice. If I go to lunch with somebody, I take one of these little teeny, really small moleskins, I put it in my back pocket, just in case something happens, somebody says something, I wanna write it down. Um, and I don't always sketch in it, I write in it quite often. Um, and then I have different size moleskins ones and I have leather bound ones and stuff. They're just, they're just I keep them around and, and I work in them all the time and I sketch. I sketch different kinds of things. Sometimes I'm sketching for assignments. Sometimes I'm just playing around. These are just, just sketches. These are just fun. And you know, I, my belief is that all this is practice. It's practice for the design assignments that are waiting to happen. So this particular, this is a design assignment here. So the, I don't care. I don't have sketchbooks for personal work and professional work. They're all the same to me because it's all part of the way we think. And I'm trying to work on my ability to see. And I have to do that by practicing in my daily life. And then I'm ready when an assignment comes. Because assignments we're doing as a designers, we're trying to, we're trying to create um, solutions that work for a particular community. So we have to be paying attention to what's going on in the world around us in order to be able to create for that world around us. I also sketch on tissue paper, on vellum. Um, and this is really, these are really more of the developmental sketches. Once I've so, got sold on an idea, I'll start to work in tissue. And I mean, I have 45, two, no, I have, I guess, 35, two inch binders of these from my whole career because I just, I sketch a lot in tissue paper and I save them, I save them because I like to go back and see if there's some kind of a remnant of something that's gonna be, that might trigger a new idea or, or has some new purpose. The other is, and, and, and everybody, because we, we are such a victim of the computer is when you work on paper and you work on tissue paper, you're able to be iterative, you're able to trace and to sort of recover an idea and improve an idea very quickly and very iteratively. Um, it's difficult to do that on the computer. And, and so, so, you know, today's discussion is a bit about staying off the computer as long as we can. The computer is good for, for, for executing. Um, there's no question that it's, it's amazing for design. It's, and it's amazing tool for thinking too, at times, but, um, my original employer, my very first employer and mentor and, and lifelong friend had a little sign posted over his desk. My first day of work there, I saw it and it says, you can't polish a horse turd. And I had to think about that for quite a while before I understood it. And it's probably even more relevant today than it was then. Cause when I started there was, we had no computers. But the point is that, that, you know, you can throw all the Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator and whatever after, a, after an idea you have. And if the idea is not that good, you're gonna spend a lot of time making a shiny, not so good idea. <laughs> and we all do it, we all do it. 
Um, but today's discussion around, is around sketching, so we don't do that. We're trying to keep from, from um, polishing horse turds. So, you know, what, what we want to do is think about sketching as a way of, of, of unearthing, of unearthing the possibilities. And if you think about it, that, that you know, the more sketches you do, um, the more possibilities you turn over. And a common mistake that we all make is we think, well, we're looking for just one solution. We just want one solution. And so we kind of keep hammering away at one little solution. And the truth is that there's a lot of solutions to any of the problems that we're given. There's just a, a lot of different solutions. And so if we change our orientation to say, well, I'm just gonna see if I can come up with a bunch of different ideas. And we try to create some fluidity, fluidity around that thinking, you will be surprised at the number of ideas that you're able to generate. So if I break, take the, the, the design process, I'm gonna break into just three super, super simple areas. The first is ideation, which is sketching. Second is valuation and the third is execution. <clears throat> Now the sketching part is, is ideation and it's, it's, it's random. We, it's, it's, it's a place where we're just free-forming. We're trying to think about something and we're trying to surround a problem. Um, the biggest mistake that we all make is that the, we start to sketch and we immediately start to evaluate those sketches. Oh, that's crappy, that's not good. And you do three not good sketches, then what happens, you're discouraged. You know, we're in a bad, you know, sort of a bad place already before we get going. And so I've disciplined myself not to think about whether it's a good solution I'm putting down or not. I'll look at it later and make that decision. We'll get into second evalu into evaluating later. So today, what we're going to talk about is really these first two, sketching and evaluation. I'm not going to talk much about execution because that's another, you know, another seminar, if you will. I'll come back and do that later. So I'm gonna go through some projects. Here's a project for the Postal Service in 2003. Um, the, the, the topic was stopping wildfires, ironically, in 2003, um, and it was to stamp. It's a very, very simple little stamp. So the way I went about it is, and they was really quite wide, wide open. They gave me a little bit of a brief and they said, um, you know, send us some finished stamps. And the way the stamps work is there's a stamp advisory board. So I don't even get to present them. I have to send mock-ups and they evaluate them. So this is pretty typical for the way I work. This is inside of a sketchbook. And this may have taken place over several hours. It's unlikely it was over, over a few hours maybe. Um, but I, time to, I work very small, I work very quickly, um, and, I'm, and, I, and I try to work sort of iconically. I'm not thinking about the drawing. This is really, really important part here, is I'm not worried about what this drawing looks like. I'm thinking about the idea that I'm trying to remind myself of. It's a hard notion to get your hands around because we're used to trying to draw something that looks exactly like it's supposed to look. I'm just trying to sort of like turn over a rock and say, well, what if it's something like this? And if I work quick enough, it keeps me from, from getting fussy. And if you look at, if you look at like this one right here, you know, I get it, those are trees. It's sort of enough, right? I don't, I don't care so much about how those trees are articulated right now. That's later, that's later. And if I was to sit and spend too much time rendering those, I might be wasting time um, and keeping my brain stuck on those trees. What I want to keep my brain doing is moving between these and going, oh, look at this idea. That's a matchstick and trees. Okay, cool. I got it. 
good enough, move on. Here's a firefighter. And, and sometimes I'll write notes, orange glow, okay, that's fire. Um, so it's really, really important to work like this. And any of you that were in um, Bruce Mouse Zoom two weeks ago, have listened to him, Bruce had this really, really great idea or, or way of presenting his view of sketches. And he said that they are, they are low resolution ideas. And I complete, I could not agree with him more. I was so excited when I heard him say that because I was, I was talking about them as being fuzzy ideas. We're kind of dancing around something, but they're really, really out of focus. So he calls them low resolution ideas. And he says, there's three things that they're cheap and they're fast and they're efficient. And that's, he's absolutely right. Um, I only disagree with one little part of it. They're cheap for us to do as a designer. They're cheap because we, in terms of time, they're very cheap. If we were say you're working on an hourly rate, they're, they're very cheap because they're fast. But to the clients, they shouldn't be cheap because this is where it happens. This is where the rubber meets the road, right here. And so, um, and I'm not sure that, I believe me, I'm sure that Bruce is aware of that because he ain't giving anything away. But um, the, the, the point is just because they were cheap and they're quick doesn't mean that they're not critical. Here's another page in the wildfire sketches. These on the left were from a different stamp. So ignore those. This was a, a love stamp. There's a birds and bees. Okay, but here's more wildfire. So what I want to do now is drill down and look at so how did I resolve these? So how do we how do we make how do we evaluate a decent idea? Um, what, what I want to do is make sure that I think it's a good enough idea before I spend time developing it. I don't want to spend too much time developing it and then tell myself, well, that was a waste of time. That wasn't really that good of an idea. So how do we short circuit that process? so that we can start to make good decisions and say that that has promise. And, and very often we just don't know, this just takes practice. I mean, you just don't get discouraged if you do one and you get this far and you go, oh, it's not that good. That's okay. You wanna make that process. I try to make it and get to that second color stage quite quickly and say, eh, this has, this has, some, this has some, uh, some promise to it. So there's the beware stamp on the left. And the big idea is the, the matchstick is the trunk of the tree. It's a little bit of a trunk loy thing. Now, this happens to be the stamp that they wanted me to do. And I'm gonna show you a bunch more, but they wanted this, this is in, in 2003. Wildfires are now not so much a function of people carelessly throwing matches out, unfortunately. Um, here's, the, here's the other one. Now, now look at this sketch on, you can see how quick this is because it's so rough. And I said, stop. And my idea here was the flames are on top and what's reflected in the water was the trees. And I thought, well, what if we flip that around? And so I flipped it around here. Um, trees on top, water. And this is, you know, those of you who know my work, I tend to cut paper and I, I have cut graphic solutions. So I can make this very, very fast and decide if it's a good idea or not. Um, so that's just particularly the way that I work. Doesn't mean it couldn't be painted. Here's another idea and, and look at my note here. This is 2003, cut loosely Rand. So I'm referencing Paul Rand. I'm like, how would Paul Rand cut a deer? And see if see what, my elements in here, I can make these out. I've got a deer, I've got trees and there's a little fire over there. Kind of says it all. You know, and this is, then I rewrote the headline to look out for wildfires and it's like, okay, they're way out in the distance. And then my point was, look at it, whatever they, look, look what has, look what's at risk here. This one's, I don't think this is a great idea, but it's, it's an interesting idea. You know, the idea that the stamp itself has actually been burned. I don't think it's a great message. Um, but it's, you know, it wasn't hard to do. Um, it doesn't tug at my heart, I guess, when I look at it as a solution. But the sketch looked promising enough for me to develop. 
again, another sketch, I'm trying to look at what are the, what are the various vistas, what are the ways to portray it? And it's like, um, there's this beautiful, beautiful landscape and there's just this little teeny flame. And all you have to do is that little spot of red says fire. And then you start to again, see the power of the risk. Now, what I'm gonna show you here is what I think is my favorite one. They didn't pick it, but um, the message I'm drawing here, I can, I know what I, I remember what I was drawing is the left side is trees, the right side is flames and look how similar they are. And it wasn't until I drew this that I wrote the copy. I said, well, left is wild and the right is fire. And this is the relationship. This is about the relationship that, that wildfires threaten. Um, those are identical shapes because I cut them and I think I did it in Photoshop. I think I colored them differently. Um, what ended up happening because this is the fire, this is the, um, the postal services, they never even did the project. It wasn't that mine got rejected and they picked somebody else, they just never did it. So I resubmitted this a couple of years ago and I keep resubmitting it and the fires get worse and they still don't seem to want to run this stamp, but you know, one day they will, um, hopefully not too late. Okay, here's, a, here's another project. And this is, a, this is a really, you know, we all have to do logos as designers and we will have to do logos forever um, as long as there are companies. This is a young guy that was a, reti was a chef that was leaving the business to make culinary, to make really, really high-end knives. And he wanted to call his company Town Cutler, which I think was a lovely name. And so this, is, this is 10 years ago. So I went to work on it. <clears throat> and, you know, what I do with the problem is I, is I immediately start to try to identify what are the, you know, what are the obvious things and what are, what's worth holding on to here? Well, this is kind of an easy one. It's a little bit like shooting fish in a barrel because it's an, he's a knife company. <laughs> you kind of, it's kind of unavoidable to, to not, you know, to not to draw a knife. The question is, can you make the knife interesting? Can you make it unique? Can you make it look like something that is, is um, that he can take ownership of? That's what that is what's the challenge is of a logo and really of anything you ever do for any company is to make it proprietary. So look at this. I'm looking at typography, I'm looking at, at, at drawings of the knife, and I'm trying to integrate the two. So this is sort of a classic design problem. Let's look at some of them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick out a few of these that I think I thought had promise. So the one on the left is kind of a, you know, a tattooy cigar box kind of a, kind of a visual. And, and you know, for him and for, for, for logo design, we're trying to help clients position themselves. And so in this case, I said, I'm gonna do some things that are very classical and I'm gonna do some things that are maybe more contemporary because he was starting the company. He didn't know, what he was. He didn't know whether he was old fashioned. He was a young guy and a hep guy. Um, so we lean toward, toward being contemporary, but the genre, the culinary genre kind of asks you to do stuff that is more classical, just the way it is, it's food. And his company is doing great 10 years later, as I must say, by the way. So, so here's more. So there's like a little, you know, monogram, TC, that doesn't have a knife. You know, I always look at, you know, what if you put a human in there? Is there something in there? And this is a chef, you know, it, it's interesting that I didn't go this way and I'm glad I didn't because I only learned after talking to him that real chefs don't sharpen knives with a, with a, uh, uh, a sharpening rod, a sharpener, they use sharpening stones. Some of them do, but he doesn't. So here's an idea here that I had of like, well, could you engage the surface with the knife? Can you make this thing have dimension with so few lines, right? So 
now I, what I, my job at this stage is I've done this to sketches. I'm not showing the sketches to the client. I never show sketches like this to a client because it's a logo. I'm going to develop it. I'm going to develop it farther than, than maybe necessary, almost finished. So these are some of the things I, I picked up from those sketches and started to build. And when I show a client like this, I might, I think I showed him six. I, they were all good. So I didn't have any trouble with showing him six. Um, I wouldn't show him anything I wouldn't want him to pick because if you show a loser, they'll always pick the loser. It's, it's kind of, <laughs> it goes, it's just the way it is in the business. If you have a bad one, they'll pick it. Um, <clears throat> but these all kind of have different flavor. This is a, this is kind of that, that classic cigar box looking. This is a very elegant, so this is somewhere in there in between. Same with all these. This one's kind of interesting, right? This is integrates the knife and the type. They all had a nice feel and he liked all of them. He liked all of them. In most cases, I did something nice with the typography for the, for the name. And that's what he chose. Um, in many ways, the most under embellished solution of all of them, right? Um, and it's interesting when you do something like this for someone, you know, particularly when the business is new, you're starting to help them. We were putting, we'd put it on tape and his boxes and stuff. But to look at the company 10 years later and see it and see how well he's used it. And I don't do much for him anymore. He does it pretty much himself. So these are the places it had to appear on. We had to be able to etch it very small inside of his knives and he still does it. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of a knife on a knife. Sometimes he just does typography. We letter press the cards and then we also rubber stamp it. So these are sort of the two ends of the spectrum that a logo has to survive. Really, really crappy printing and really, really beautiful printing. And that's, that's still pretty typical for a lot of businesses, even though obviously online is easy to do. So I give him great credit. He, he first opened his stores in San Francisco and then he opened a store in Chicago and he did this sign without me. He made this sign and this is cut out obviously. And I was so proud of him and so happy to see it. I just made me smile. I thought, you're the first client that hasn't screwed up a logo I've given you, you know, by doing something on your own. And so he's always done things that are faithful and interesting and, and in the vein that it was originally, you know, originally created. So after that, just so it goes, once you developed a relationship with a client, I could, you know, sketch anything for him. So we did a newspaper um, a couple of years ago. And, and one of the things that happens is you start to have you know, opportunities of things that you've already discovered, you've already worked on. I started playing with this knife idea a lot. So this is, a, this is a, just a storyboard of what the, the contents of an eight page newspaper is gonna be. And this is what it looked like. This is all about his process. And then I did a poster for him. You know, chefs are a different breed and you can do this. this is his audience is chefs, even though, you know, the general public buy his knives, but they aspire to be chefs. This is, I don't know where this came from. It came out of my sketchbook, some idea of this rabbit that survived. So to show you what kind of client he is, I had done this drawing, I had done this sketch in a sketchbook. And I, I think I posted on Instagram at Halloween. It was just a funny sketch, just to these rats, but I thought he'd like it because it had the knife. I guess he loved it because he came back and he got it tattooed on his, <laughs> on his belly. <laughs> That's pretty disturbing. Okay. Posters, everybody wants to do posters, gets to do posters, we love them. And, and they're the hardest thing. 
to do to do well. Um, and I've done a lot of them, but they never cease to challenge me for all the right reasons. So this is a jazz festival. Um, everybody's seen jazz festival posters. And in fact, I think those are some of the best posters ever created internationally or for jazz festivals. And so this is just a lot of sketches. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity because there's, there's different instruments, there's different attitudes. It's an audio experience, if you will. Um, and so I'm just really, really wrestling around with what are the possibilities here? Um, the, the, you know, there's guitars, the saxophone is iconic for being a jazz, representing jazz. Um, so is a stand-up bass. Um, so I'm wrestling around. I'm just working around, kind of going, what are the possibilities here? What, what kinds of things? You see this ear chair? Here's a flower coming out of a saxophone. I'm not really worried about typography, you know? I'm not thinking about that. I'm trying to think about the central image. You know, we'll build the type later. I'll build that onto that. So I try to think about what's the what's the real root of the of the of the message here? What's the what's the central visual? So I think what I was trying to tell myself on this one on the left, it was what if how minimal can we make this? There's a saxophone, there's a couple of hands, and there's a hat. Kind of a nice idea. This one I didn't execute, and I, I, I really would like to do this. I was telling myself, keep, see, look, as I have notes, cut paper silhouettes, different colors. So I know what I was thinking here. I was thinking, what if you did this whole drawing, did this drawing of a guy playing sax? And you take, you just do a black and white drawing. And then you, you say Xerox that onto five different colors, pieces of colored paper. And then you cut those pieces apart and you put them back together and then you photograph it. See the temptation is to get on Photoshop and do this or something, but it takes away from the spontaneity and the possibilities that might happen here. I mean, I, I did not execute this. I would love to, my mind's eye sees this. Now, I don't know how that happens, but it happens. And if I didn't sketch this down, I wouldn't remember it. And I wouldn't think to go there. And part of what happens when you sketch is that that gets saved, not only in a sketchbook, but I've gone through this experience and I can recall that. I will recall that on some other assignment. So when we think about sketching, we have to think about the idea that, that it's, it's um, you're building a reservoir of data, if you will, and memories, and they will recycle, they will come back. And if you're a designer for your lifetime, you will want them to come back because you will be, be a day when you feel short on ideas and you want those to come back for you. So here's the idea of an ear chair. This is like one of those classic cane bar, bar chairs. And I'm just, my mind says it's that shape so resembles an ear. What if it was shaped like an ear? Now, let's talk for a second about evaluating these, you know, to decide whether to, to pursue this or not. I'm trying to, th this is gonna take a little work to pursue this one, not a lot, but, but a little bit. And I'm not sure that it's that great of an idea. And I'll tell you why, because there's a little bit of redundancy in it because we're, we're putting an ear on something that's already audio. It's okay because they're, I mean, that's really what it's about, but it's like, I don't think it's that funny. Or I don't think it's that clever. Um, and some people might, and I might have 10 years ago, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to refine my standards, if you will. So that's part of what every one of us brings to the table in terms of our evaluation. Um, I could make this be a pretty good poster, but I wasn't convinced at the time that I want, it was the best idea I had on the table. 
So I continue. <clears throat> These are kind of cool, kind of interesting. They would be really pretty. But again, I just don't, I didn't feel that they said anything for me. It didn't, it didn't move me. Decent, decent. And I know what I did here. I, I thought, well, there's something cool about the guy that plays the stand-up bass. There's something very, very cool about it. And I, you see what I'm doing? I'm already drawing a border around. I'm already cropping. And I thought, well, what if I take a piece of that? Can I take what is the everyday view that we all know and make that interesting? That was, I know that was the assignment I was giving myself. And so I started to do that. So I drew that and I thought, what can I strip away so that this thing has all the essential elements? I kind of put the same stripes as the bass strings in his, in his vest. That made it kind of interesting. You know, if you're gonna do a cool poster, you gotta do it for jazz because it's, it should be cool. I thought that was okay. I thought, well, what if I, what if I crop in closer and what if I put color to it? You know, I've already worked out a type solution. I kind of played with that. I haven't shown these to the client. I'm just, I'm just riffing here. I'm just trying to find out if anything's, anything's worth it here. And I went back and I, I, did, I wasn't convinced. So I went back and looked at my sketches again. And I saw this one down here in the corner and it said, discordant dissonance. And I, I think that's what jazz is. It's, there, I'm not a jazz aficionado, and I know there's a couple of people listening that are that can write me on this, but I felt like, how could I make this poster look dissonant? How could I create that sound visually? And so I looked at, I thought that for a second, what's coming out of the saxophone? And then I remembered, I did this sketch about eight years ago in my sketchbook. I don't know why, just for fun, okay? I was just playing around. I did, it was not an assignment. It was nothing. I was, just did that sketch and I said, there it is. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to make. So I used that and I redrew it. And then made the poster. There it is. Of course, there's a bunch of design decisions that I made in the, in the process. Of course there are of typography and color and so forth, but that's all execution. The idea was right there. There's a million ways to color this and it was then they're all good answers. I, I tried so many different ways, but I decided to make them stripey, you know, Dr. Susie. I just wanted this thing just to vibrate. Anyway, successful. So, this last, I'll do this last one and then we'll go to uh, some questions. This is a book cover. And this is a friend that an, an ex creative director from Chiat Day who had written a book. Uh, he'd interviewed 10 of the sharpest CEOs, most of them, not necessarily, many of them in technology, um, about how they lead and how they manage the complexity of running a company. And so in essence, how they make order out of chaos. Okay, so then to make it further more complicated or for more difficult for me, the writer calls it Think Simple. I mean, how good is, that's a great title, but he's already done half the work for me. So now I have to do something incredibly simple that, edu that, that illustrates thinking simply. What does that look like? And I kept going back to the second part of it, which is that, that smart leaders defeat complexity. So I wanted to, to redefine the book about how do we get order out of chaos? So again, I'm just starting to just muse here. I'm not even designing the cover. I'm just thinking of imagery. Quickly, quickly moving around, quickly going from there's a pencil and a stump and there's a strainer with things and a few things are coming out. And there's a funnel, which is, which is taking lots of stuff and putting into one. So these are, these are all, and they're really, really, I'm talking to myself and I'm saying, well, what if he's, 
What if these two pieces together makes one makes an arrow? What is there? What is there there? Keep, keep going, keep drawing, Craig. Okay, what about this? Oh, what's this a half man? He's out, he's coming apart and he's together on the, on the simple side. Here he's got a, you know, wad of chaos and his head is seeing clarity. Here's a crazy pencil. Here he's standing on rocks. Here he's coming apart. Um, again, here's more solutions. And I think at some point I thought, well, I, I was just in love with this pencil coming out of a stump that we're making something clean and simple out of something complicated. So I just drew this. I just did the drawing. It wasn't a finished drawing, I just did it. Again, the client has seen nothing. I haven't, he's not involved. Look at some of these sketches though. So if this is the first things I've, I sketched out was a thimble. A thimble is so amazingly simple and efficient and, and useful. And so is a push pen. So I, gr I grasp for symbols. I grasp for universal symbols that everybody understands. And so these don't end up in the solution but they get my brain going in that place and they're quick and easy to sketch. Man holds single arrow, has lots of arrows in his head. Let's back to that one. You know, what is it? What is it about that? Is that good? I don't know. You know, I'm still looking at going thinking, maybe, maybe it's decent. This doesn't have any future, but I love it. Don't know why. You know, like this little pencil is really great, but it's not gonna work on the cover. I just, I just know already it doesn't lend itself to the proportion. This has promise, weird, really weird. So then I start building covers. These are, you know, so I've, I, I'm, I'm happy. I've got enough solutions that I can make these quick mock-ups for myself and see how they feel. The book covers are really easy to mock up quickly. Cause I, you know, I can take that rough sketch and now I start to get emotion. I'm starting to color this with um, giving it temperature. Is this, is this a cool color? Is it hot? Does it, does it have, what kind of urgency does it have? Does it have any emotive possibilities? You know, and, and when you're evaluating these, you know, what I think about both with sketches and with this sort of this level of development as I go, is this shedding any light on the message? Have I added anything to it? That's what's so critical is it's, it's, as designers, are we improving the understanding of the message? And if we're not improving it, then we're getting in the way of it. <laughs> so whenever I do anything at some point, I'm going, am I contributing something? Have I advanced the cause? Have I advanced the understanding? Have I advanced the, the reader's curiosity? Have I elevated the... Have I elevated the message? In this case, Think Simple is so smart as a title, it's so provocative. I would, had to be very careful not to get in the way of it and not to get, and not to confuse it, but to, but to, but to be as smart as it was. You know, so I, I do these covers and then I read the headline to myself and say, does that make sense? Think simple, how smart leaders defeat complexity. And so that looks like, okay, there's the, there's the one arrow and that's a great corporate symbol. It's an arrow of moving forward advancement. That's, that's arising from the wreckage there. Kind of good. Feels a little playful to me, a little child, a little too childlike. So that's one of those sketches I did. And, and sometimes, the, the execution of it makes it 
more interesting. This is something we only learn when we, when we play, when we try stuff out. How long do you think it took me to do this? Two and a half minutes? Not a big deal. It's just a color sketch, basically. Cut it out of paper, threw the paper down, put my iPhone, put a light on it, an iPhone, bam, shot it. If I just spent too much time on this, it would look fussy, but it's that simple. It's that easy. And so this is, the, this is in the vein of Paul Rand and, and Ivan Shermayoff and Saul Bass, the guys that have done, have mastered this idea of using simple graphic forms to express complex messages. I had to do a type solution, you know, <laughs> as much as I wanted to draw the cover. Um, kind of interesting, not sure what I think about it. This is based on and sort of a cliche, you know, people talk about, did you solve the problem? Did you thread the needle? You know, and threading the needle is really hard. And, and, but we don't say that in the title. I want you to look at it and go, oh, that's, oh, that's the eye of the needle. I just went through the eye of the needle. And they talk about that. That's, a, that's perfection. You got through the eye of the needle. I didn't want the book to end up in the craft section though, in the, uh, sewing and knitting section. So there we use the tree that I drew, colored it. Interesting. So if you can see this, I'm, I'm, I'm gathering a lot of very different possibilities here. Big typographic solution. And there's that, that um, unwound pencil. The pencil for me is, is the symbol of creativity and the symbol of business and it's a symbol of thinking. Um, as much as few, as, many, as few of us use pencils anymore, um, it still is that icon and it's a universal icon and it's a wonderful form to draw. So I finally mocked up, this is what I showed the client. I showed him four of them and I showed them in their dimensional form because a book is a three-dimensional, you, you get the benefit of the spine and you need the benefit of the spine. And if you, unless you know the book, I, I'm gonna ask all of you, you don't have, cause I don't hear you, of which one you think, which one do you think you would have chosen? Not which one you think the client chose, which one you would have chosen. And I think they're all good answers, basically. I don't think there's a bad one, with the exception, I think this one is, it's ironic that you have to cut down a tree to make an idea. I think this has some negativity to it. So that's what he picked. <clears throat> and that's what we produced. And I was pleased that he did because it's, it's such an abstract idea. Um, and it's, and it's a lot about thinking and maybe that think, maybe that even feels like a brain on the bottom. I don't know. That wasn't my intention, but do you see, I want to go back to my sketch. There's where it happened. And that, that happened because I didn't give up. I just kept drawing. And, um, I wrote something down yesterday. I thought I put it in the presentation, but I didn't, I guess that, you have to think about sketching. Sketching is part of the athletic metaphor, but it's a little like sit-ups. It's the 25th sit-up that makes the first five valuable, that makes them important. And, and what I mean by that is that, that if you do 25 sketches, sometimes your 25th one is not very good, but it says, you know, I've really, really thought this thing through. And those first five are awesome. Those are really, my first hunches were really good. And sometimes you have to go 25 and the 25th is really good. But so it's important to do, to do 25 or do 15 or whatever. You gotta do a lot so that you know to appreciate the ones that, that excel. How 
how am I on time? Should we go to questions? Do you, do you want me to show me one, one last run through here? It's, it's up to you, Craig. Um, okay. Go ahead and show one Let's more. Let's do this one. This is the last here. And this is, this is my day job um, because this is, this is an illustration job. But, and it's also really current. I did this three weeks ago. So this is a magazine that comes out of a financial company in Scotland and they hire me to do their covers and interiors. And it's always on an essay. And the essay was on purpose, not governance. This is about investing. So it's already abstract or it's gonna be abstract. So let me define what purpose, not governance means. It's an article about ESGs, which are environmental, social and, and governance. ESG, they set some criteria and standards for companies um, operations that will be hopefully socially conscious. Um, and the argument in the, in, the, in the essay is that that's not really the case, that they are too constrictive and we're constricting some of the performance and behaviors of the companies because of these ESGs. It's complicated. I don't expect you to understand it, it took me a while, but this is what happens in my, a lot of my projects is that I don't even understand it. It's so, it's until I can understand it, that I can start to develop some kind of a metaphor to help someone else understand it. So in many ways, I'm the perfect client. This is the way I work with them. They send me the articles, they've, they've laid out the magazine and I, they gave me some blue highlights of things they thought were kind of salient points. I didn't necessarily agree, but they trying to be helpful. Um, I remind myself sketches July 13th, finals the 30th, <laughs> stay focused. So I read through the article and I just sketch on the thing. I just sketch around here as I go. And in this case, I don't think I used a sketchbook. I went to a tissues from there and I kept going, kept making ideas. And my central theme was, was this, that, that things that are, that are constricted or, or caged, if you will, are, or, or, or have a, def a definition of their of their parameters are restrictive. And so I'm trying to say, what if what happens if you eliminate that, if you change that? And so what I'm always trying to do is like, how can you change the world? How can you shuffle the deck just a little bit so this thing is just slightly unusual so that it's, it's a riddle to solve. It's something to understand that you haven't seen before. And I do this for myself. I'll, I'll look at these two hours later and I go back and I'll put an X. I don't put the X at the moment. I go back and look at it and say, that has, that, that's got possibility. So my next step, well, here, these, are, these were pieces of paper that were, these are, I think I did these while I was eating a bowl of cereal. Um, I just had a piece of paper sitting there and I was thinking about the problem and I just sketched these down. These are on both sides. It's a little teeny, teeny card, <clears throat> but I do that. You know, you don't know when, this doesn't come when you ask it. It comes when it comes and you need to be ready. So these, these are the ideas that I thought these had some real merit to them. There's that damn pencil thing again. I do that a lot. You know, these are, these are one and a half inches tall. So I take those. And I redraw them. I draw them a couple times with a tissue, and I get them to a, to what I consider to be um, sort of user friendly quality. They're good enough that they portray the idea in the clearest possible way without spending a lot of time and energy. And that's what I'm going to show the client. And in this case, I always put manuscript with it. I go and find the nuggets that I think I'm illustrating. So what I, here's my deliverables to them, a cover and three interior full page illustrations. So I need four illustrations. I'm gonna give them 12 sketches. It makes their job, makes, it's a lot of work for me, but a client loves to have choices and they love to start to understand the places I'm trying to take them. So I'll find a passage in and I'll say, see, that's, this means that, this means that. And they so appreciate that. And this, this particular client loves that I do this for them. So here's, here's four of them. 
Here's another four. And in this case, I put some tone in them because it just gives them a little bit of depth. These are, these are very small sketches that I do. They're about four inches tall. I scan them into Photoshop and I put tint in them. I do not color them because I don't want, that's not the conversation I wanna have yet. I wanna have the, the conversations around this idea. Do you understand these ideas? And they then pick these. I don't get to meet them there in Scotland, obviously. They send me back a PDF and they put these in place in the layout and they say, these are our choices. Finish them, Craig. No discussion. There's, there's nothing, I don't, they don't need any more work. And so I don't invite that. <laughs> and this is what the finish looked like. It's ironic that they're called trust because they certainly do. They trust me. And they give me a lot of, they give me very, very hard assignments to try to make interesting and make wonderful. And that's why we sketch. I am now happy to open this up to questions from any of you and all of you. Are we good on time? A little We're bit great. Time. Yeah, thank you so I'll much. I'll stay as long yeah. as you guys want. So, um, should I flip this back, Hank? What's the best thing so I can see people? Yeah, come back to yeah. Uh, stop share. All right. Talk to me. Hi, Craig. Can you hear me? I can. Who's talking to me? My name's Mara. I'm going to see you. I'm going to try to see you. Oh, there you are. Hi, Mara. Hi. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but um, how do you approach a client who picks the ugly logo? And how do you turn that ugly feeling that you get when you look at it into something that moves you and the client? Um, I wouldn't show them the ugly logo. <laughs> but what if you accidentally do? <laughs> well, what if something happens? That would never happen. You could never, you can never do that accident. I mean, you can do the ugly logo, but you have to. Um, I, there's not. I would never ever show a client something that I didn't want them to pick. Even if, even if I was trying to show them what bad design looked like, they they might argue for it. It's it's a whole mindset that you just can't get into. I mean it's very often that I'll have a preference of them and I'll have to work towards, towards convincing them of that one. Then you get into whole, sort of a design discussion with the merits of them, if you will. Um, but I, you know, I just wish I could, I can't ask that. Just you'd, you'd never show somebody something you don't want to have produced. And, you know, it gets to this point of, we have to become the judges of our own work before we show it to our client. You know, not all clients are as good at making judgments as Hank is. In fact, no clients are that good because Hank is a professional designer of boundless experience and knowledge and understanding. And he brings that to the table. Most clients, most of them, not all of them, have very limited understanding and so we have to be careful with entrusting them on deciding for us whether our stuff works because they're going to go from their gut. And sometimes that's not the best place. They're gonna go, well, I just, you know, I just don't like that color. Well, why don't you? Well, I, it's just not my favorite color. And you say, well, sorry, but this is for the general public. It's gotta work out there. Yellow is a better color because it works from across the street. I'm sorry you don't like yellow, but we're really trying to serve your client. We're not, you know, with all due respect, I'm, I'm trying to make, help you consider the larger audience. So we have to do a lot of work to keep our clients 
making good decisions. So when I do a presentation, I really remind them of objectives and I try to walk down the problem that we're trying to solve um, and help them make the right decision. That was a very long answer, Mara, though. It was a good question. No, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Another. Touching up on what you just said, when it, talks, when it comes to client feedback and revisions, do you have a certain framework when it comes to limiting revisions or, or structuring, uh, I guess, feedback in a way where, um, you know, kind of going down a, a wild uh, goose chase? That's a good question about revisions. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of revisions. Um, nobody is, but I'm not a fan of as a part as part of the process, at least at the kind of work that I do. And the reason is because um, you have to consider the audience and considering who's asking to make the revisions. And very often it's in the, in the, for instance, the work that I do where I'm doing an illustration and I have something in there that's hidden and I have a message and I have a, I have a, there's a, a balance of scale of items and, and, and it's not uncommon that a client will say, well, I don't think anybody's going to get that. So can you make that bigger and louder and funnier? Um, it's the old make the logo bigger and clients do that because they're insecure. They're insecure that, that the message isn't going to get through. Um, and I happen to know differently and I'm experienced enough and I'm confident in that, that subtlety is the way in and you have to go in through somebody's heart and you have to. So I argue really, really fearlessly about those principles. And then it gets, so that gets into sort of a principled argument. And, and, and I try to allay those revisions or find out where they come from. Um, and it doesn't mean that things can't be improved and you don't work iteratively. Sometimes you do. Illustration, I don't because it's, you know, either I get it or I don't. That's the way I feel about it. But design like logos, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, it's very often that somebody, when I send them six logos, they might say, well, good, can you meld those all together and make one logo? Well, you can't, that's six different, there's different desperate ideas. And so, um, for instance, if I get a design assignment or an illustration assignment, it comes from say an agency and they give me the schedule and they say, well, okay, you have sketches on this day and this day we have revisions. And then this day we have your second passes. And then after that we have revisions. I turn it down because you know why? Because they've already built revisions in. They've already asked everybody to chime in and try to change it. Um, and I'm sorry, but at least the clients that, that I work with, they're really smart people, but they haven't spent their life doing this. And very few of them, unless you're Steve Jobs, is going to be able to really, really weigh in. And, it, and, and that's not a criticism of people's intelligence. It's just a criticism of, of you know, people's ability to comprehend what we've been spending a lifetime trying to get to, right? So I do spend a lot of time trying to, to educate a client. I do it up front and it's building trust and it's building, you know, and once you get that built in, then clients go, okay, I kind of see your, I'm starting to understand your point. So it's a yeah. lifelong problem in design. <laughs> yeah, it's trust for sure. One more question um, on, the, on the last example that you, that you showed where um, we had final um, illustrations. What was the, um, the coloring technique you use on those last examples that was it like photoshop or did you how i color those those are um yeah i cut the work out of amberlith you can watch a video on my website i'll show you how i do it i cut them and then i scan it and then i color it in photoshop i just um and i have a palette i like and i play with them and um that's a for instance back to your revisions question if, if i think there are options and colors. I'll just show them the options if I like them. Like here's a deep black, a dark sky. Here's a light sky. I'll show them that and say, you guys pick one. But um, if I asked all of you people for color suggestions on my work, every one of you would have a different opinion. And so since I'm responsible for it, and since it's my career that I have to get known for, I'm sorry, but I have last right of refusal and uh, or approval, whatever. 
and and I demand that because and you should too because your work is your work it's not their work <laughs> clients confuse that you will get known for the work you do and and you want to you want to keep that in mind it makes you fight fierce fiercely for for your for your solutions thank you yes you're welcome Hi, Craig. Uh, my name is Maggie. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I'm in the master's program here at Miami Ad School in Furman. I'm looking for you, Maggie. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> thank you for taking the time. Are you kidding? Um, I was just hoping if you could kind of explain more on how it seems as though you find beauty in imperfection when you're sketching. So what advice would you give someone as a young designer to help try and overcome trying to perfect every single element when they're sketching in the original stages? Well, it's a really good question. And it, it's, it, it's a central challenge that all of us have every time we draw something is to think about how, you know, we want it to look like the thing when we're doing it. We wish we could do that. And I don't draw that well quickly. I have to stop and it's kind of a different thing when I'm really trying to work something out. But if I'm trying to draw roughly, um, I just have to turn off that sort of that beauty switch and don't worry about it. Um, I, I look at, at mm. what if, you know, I always tell myself I can make this better later. I can get to that. but give me what are the central axes what are the central elements how does this thing what's the big idea and if the idea is beautiful think of it this way if the idea is beautiful if it's poetic you can make you can deliver it that way and and as as a as a designer what we want to do is keep make sure that we that we don't get in the way of that idea you know what i mean we don't overstate it we don't over embellish it Computer will make us do that, by the way. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't really think that they're that, I think I do a lot of sketches that are not very good, that don't look very good. Let me put you in the center here because I keep looking at you, I'm sorry. There we go, now I see you. And, and I think that, that the, um, you know, it, it's a practice thing. You have to keep doing it and prove to yourself that, that, that's why I like to put up these sketches and show you the comparison and go, see that crappy sketch? You know, it's like, it's like I saw promise in that. It's like, it's like getting the puppy, the ugliest puppy, and, and you watch it grow up and it turned out to be the beautiful dog. Why? Because, you, because it has a big heart. It's the beautiful, that's what it is. And so if you can have one of those sketches and, and have some confidence that somewhere in there is, a, is, a, is an interesting idea that if I work at it enough, I will... I will turn it into beauty. And, and this is why I love work like by, by Paul Rand or by, by Ivan Shermayoff. These guys take a piece of paper and cut it and put it together and it has beauty and it has beauty not in the sense of being polished and rendered, it has beauty in its, in its simplicity. You know, that's a measure of beauty that's just it's really, really hard to get. And I like to trade in that because it's, one, I like to work quickly and I'm very impatient. So that starts to happen for me by my impatience. And um, we've all done this. You know, when you've worked something too far, you're just like, ah, it went away. And you're going, you're command Z, command Z, you're trying to get back to that place. And so I always try to stay a couple steps back from that precipice. Stop before you're, stop before you're done long answer as usual, sorry. That's very helpful. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Hi, Craig. Um, I also just have a quick question. Um, hi. Oh, there you are. Um, I know you're probably at a point in your career where your clients are familiar with your work, but has anyone ever asked you for a, like a particular style? Um, and how do you approach that? Like if they ask for a style of illustration, do you usually like decline or do you think differently when you're sketching? No, I would probably decline if they were really specific about it, particularly if they wanted me to do something I couldn't do. If somebody wanted me to do an oil painting, I would say, not only would I decline, I would 
embarrass myself if I attempted it because I couldn't do it. Um, it's, it's kind of a dicey place to go um, because they already have a criteria that I'm supposed to measure up to. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they picked it or why they do. Sometimes it's right. It's, it's like, well, that's not for me. I shouldn't do it. I, it should go to somebody that does that. Mm -hmm. um, so stylistically, what I appreciate is somebody comes to me and they say, you know, these are some things that you have done in the past and we like that something about those. Mm -hmm. So I try to pretty much stay in my lane. Now I will surprise them. If I decide I want to do a watercolor or something, I will surprise them and they are surprised and they often are not happy. But, you know, I try to, I kind of, you don't want to announce that. Yeah. You know, Christoph does that. Christoph Neiman does that a lot better than I do. He has many styles and jumps around. I'm pretty much known for the stuff that you see. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, at some point in time, that becomes a little bit of a trap. But um, So the, the, the other thing I was going to say is that I also don't take direction from art directors. And what I mean by that is that if somebody... An art director's job typically is to do sketches and tell an illustrator or a photographer what they want them to do. Mm -hmm. um, I just am not interested in it. It doesn't, it, the fun for me is the sketching thing, is the discovery. Right. And I don't think that, if I don't know what I think, I really don't think they know what I think. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> for them to say, well, Craig, I like the buckets you used on that one and the boat in that one, and I like the sunset in that one. If you can put those together, you know, just produce it. And it's like, what would be the fun in that? <laughs> and so. going back to what you said about like trapping yourself in your style, what, um, like, how do you get out of that? Like, do you feel repetitive after you create like a series of illustrations in the same way? And, and then, like you said, like, do you just randomly like do something in watercolor or do you actively try to like engage in different um, like experimentation, maybe just for yourself? I do for myself. I'm doing more of that for myself and I've been doing watercolor stuff. Um, but I don't, uh, this commercial work that I do, most of it, uh, I'm pretty satisfied with the way that I work. Now mm -hmm. I can show you work in this book I'm working on, I'm gonna be working on with, with Hank. I'm gonna do a, a monograph. I'm gonna show some of my early work, a lot of my early work. Um, that I think is rich in idea and, and is a little understudied in execution. And now mine, the risk I have now is being overstudied in execution because I've, I've gotten better at it. And, mm -hmm. and I look back at some of the early work and I like the innocence of it. Mm -hmm. You hear this with musicians, you know, he's like, they get famous on their third album and then people suddenly want to hear their first stuff and they say, wow, that was really good. You know, it's like, yeah. why aren't you more like that? And so, I'm cautious of getting repetitive in the sense of just, um, I don't want to repeat ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't mind repeating my character and some of those things. I don't mind that. I might, I mean, there, there, I can tell if I'm, if I'm getting lazy. I think that's what you're talking about. I don't want to get lazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always trying to sort of go, how mysterious can I make the riddle? How much, how deep can I bury it? I talk about, I like to, I like to trade in, um, an illustration should have breadcrumbs. It should not be the full loaf. If you have breadcrumbs, then you as the reader gets to follow the trail and figure out what I was trying to say and go, aha. But if I plop the loaf down on it and go, see what it is, it's a loaf of bread, you go, mm -hmm. Okay, done, turn the page. So I'm trying to suspend that page turning. And so that's, that's the bigger challenge um, for me as I develop, you know, 25 years into this, into the, at least the illustration part. The last, there was, I'm, I'm looking at some of my notes here that I'd given and I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is back to one of the questions about doing beautiful, simple, uh, or, or beautiful little sketches. I don't do this as much, and it's a good, and I and I I should is 
if you get stuck sketching, get a blunter pen, get a fatter pen or a fatter pencil that will not give you the precision that you're getting caught up with. Now I, I, I say that and I draw with microns all the time, but I draw really small. <laughs> so draw smaller and draw with a blunter pen because that will make you simplify. It's like drawing with a bar of soap. It's like, and, and you know, I, I always remind myself when my kids were little, this is what they could do so well. And I go, how did they do that? They draw a head and arms and there it is. And it communicates. So therein lies the beauty, again, back in the elegance and the simplicity of the message. And as you start to change your tools, um, it, will, it will start to inform what things look like. Strangely enough, it will lead you down a path. This idea, um, one of the things about sketchbooks, and if you notice, I show you, I'll have a spread and it might have 18 sketches on it. I don't do a sketch on a page, turn it, do another one, turn it. I want them all to swim in the same pool because I wanna be, when I'm drawing another one, I wanna be aware of that other one over next to it. And there's a fluidity that's happening. There's, and I'm hoping for some contamination to happen on the page. So, and it's a weird, and you're getting into a space, you know, you're trying to get in, you're trying to immerse yourself. And I, what I don't want to do is get ahead of the problem. I want to stay behind the problem always and keep shoving ideas out that might work. You know, don't, nothing is precious. They're not precious. Any more? Hi, Craig. Um, can you? Where are you? Yeah, I'm my um, oh, I was. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering what what are your thoughts about and tips about trying to be a self taught illustrator. It works. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Go to as many seminars for the illustrators as you can. Um. I don't, you know, those are two smart ass answers to your question and I apologize. Um, what my advice is to take as many design courses as you can before you become an illustrator, which is what you're doing, I think. Um, because you will learn the context that you have to illustrate within and you'll learn how the business works and that will forever change your illustration. I mean, I was lucky enough to work for 20 years and have my own firm and work for, there's a gentleman that's on the panel here who was a mentor and a deep friend, dear friend of mine. And that experience, and, I, and he hired me because I could draw, but I still was a designer for a long, long time and I learned to think like a designer. And that will make you then you just draw, then you're drawing ideas as an illustrator. You, you, are, you are in the service of communication. So many people become illustrators because they like to draw and that's, you should, you should love to draw. But the best illustrators out there are loved by designers and art directors because they add to the story, they contribute and they contribute to the, the whole concept of messaging. Every company, every magazine, every you know, website is interested in connecting with viewers. And if you can bring a visual component that helps them connect, you will be a contributing illustrator. And you can do that whether you're drawing, you know, pen and ink or oil painting or whatever you want to do. There's many ways to do it. That's your personal, that's our personal opportunity, all right, our way in. Um, but the more we have sight of the objective and the purpose, the easier that job is going to be as an illustrator. Is that helpful? That answer your question? Very, thank you. Okay. Right. 
any thoughts about the power, the advantages, disadvantages of illustration versus photographic imagery? Particularly no, in- a great question. And I love photography and I, and I art directed a lot of photography when I was, when I was uh, a designer and worked with some of the best photographers and they taught me how to see and how to understand light. And, and that informed my illustration. Um, the line has gotten very fuzzy between the two now because of Photoshop and because there's so much um, conceptual photography, if you will, we'll call it that because it's been manipulated. And I think that the, the I, I'm not a big fan of that, of, of highly manipulated photography because it has a technical quality to me. A lot of it lacks heart and soul. It's really hard to get that in the computer. It's just really hard. <laughs> I mean, there's some people that can do it and Matt Mahern and people like that were really, really great at it. But, um, you know, I always say if a, if a client wants me to draw something in its reality and draw it, then I say, I shouldn't be doing it. I, you should be using a photograph because a photograph will give you a beautiful rendition. And if I draw it, I'm going to give you an interpretation of that. And where there's nothing wrong with that, it's just that, you know, I believe that an illustrator ought to be contributing, they ought to be taking you to a place that you cannot go in a photograph. My job has always been, you know, is you can't, I'm trying to create a dream world for you for a moment in time while you're looking at it, right? That it's believable that that vine curved like that and it made that face. I want you to believe that for just a second. And I think it's very difficult to do that in a photograph because you photographs tend to be so realistic that, you know, it, it, it just, it's not otherworldly enough for me. That's a really long answer again, Ralph, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, kind of a follow up in one of your blog posts, you said something, I think it was the brain loves puzzles. And you talked about um, that engagement that you can get with uh, right. say an, an ambiguous image or, and you know, the reference a suturism. Mm -hmm. um, and I came across somebody, um, a video animator, and he was making kind of the point, not talking about dramatic structure, but uh, analogous to what point you're making. He says, you have to make the viewer curious enough to want to keep watching what happens next, what happens next. And when I saw your blog post, I thought, I've thought of that. Do you have any advice uh, regarding sketching for people working in temporal media, video? Um, I think it's the same thing because it's storytelling. I mean, I, I think about it when I've done kids books, those are it's you're trying to tell a story and break it into 32 pages but it's a little movie basically and you're because you're you're making taking stills out of it so i think that when you when you work in video it's it's i think it's definitely difficult because i always think of an illustration <clears throat> as a moment in time it's a slice and if you look at mine many times something has just happened or it's about to happen you've 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 come to a place in time where you're, where you're getting more benefit than one page because there's a fore and aft that it implies. And so that's to me, you know, they always talk about what's the story, story and make story. And you wanna be able to say, well, what if? And so you go, the idea is to have a viewer look at it and say, what if this happened? What if that happened? The problem with video is that we have video so we can tell the story, the full story, right? And so I guess the answer to your question is one that I'm probably out of my realm in answering, that it's, it's what makes good cinema, what makes good motion storytelling. Um, and it's a story that keeps you guessing, right? You have, to, you have to, again, function in breadcrumbs and not in loaves. You have to, I mean, it's what, what all good, all good video offers the surprise between cuts and dissolves. What is it that happens that I didn't expect was gonna happen? Yeah. 
I wasn't even thinking so much in terms of the execution as what you were um, speaking of sketching as an idea generator that it might take 25 times. Before how do you get, how do you sketch uh, to do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good, good question. I'll tell you what I would do. I would start at the end and I would think in terms of the, of the resolve, what's, where's this thing end up and then work backwards and go, how do I deconstruct this in such a way that, I can, I can create mystery, suspense, interest, curiosity about this, how it's going to resolve, you know? Um, but I think, but when you say that, I mean, I think about, and I only saw it recently. I mean, they, they re reissued it. Um, uh, Yellow Submarine. It's so crazy that you, I mean, every bit of it just continues to surprise, right? I mean, it's just stills after stills after stills that are beautiful. And so I think it's tough. I mean, I think you're, you're, you're constantly in motion, you're constantly fighting the potential of boredom, right? It's like, Really, this is taking a long time to get to you. Yeah. So those are, the, those are the fights and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that you have to, um, you have to, you, I talk a lot about surprise. And so I think you, you constantly have to, to infer rather than define and think in inferences and think of suggestions that people get to arrive at their own conclusions. Okay. Anybody else? I can keep going. You guys wearing out? I was wondering about um, how you use texture in your work and how you make the decision to add or not add texture um, in this like Adobe Illustrator era. I notice a lot of illustrators getting rid of texture altogether. And I just wonder, like, how do you go through that decision process of um, whether you want it to be flat or how you pick what you do. I, I'm really, really careful about not texturizing things because I don't, I don't want to distract from it. Keep in mind, I came, I started originally just cutting paper. That's the way I worked. And so I'm, I'm pure, pretty much a purist of that. I have, I have changed in time to, um, not changed, but I occasionally will, will do renderings when I'm render a sky. My phone is ringing, excuse me. I will render a sky and put some gradation in, but I'm, I don't, you know, I don't use tone to speak of. If there's a shadow, it's a hard shadow. Um, and texture, it's only in the service of the piece. If there's grass, make, give it some texture. But I don't, I'm scared of dressing things up a little bit because they get in the way of the purity of it for me. And that's, you know, that's the problem with Photoshop filters and all this. This is a whole other discussion, but the risk that we all as designers by using the same software, everything you have access to, the other person has access to. So we tend to, we, it, we have to be very, very careful about doing things with the name of the game is, doing work that, that we can own in the marketplace in the sense that it looks like something that we made alone. And so we have to be cautious of sameness, of, of looking like everybody else. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. You do it, I'd like to do it at the idea stage first, which is the sketching stage. But the execution is really, really tricky because there's a temptation to use a lot of the stuff that, that the, the software has, if you will. Um, I think Illustrator is brilliant. It's one of the most difficult programs in the world. And I use it for many of my illustrations, even after I've cut them, I might redraw them in Illustrator because they have to be scaled huge or something. But um, I use both Photoshop and Illustrator. I might as well be using the versions they put out 10 years ago because I don't use a lot of the whistles and the bells that they have with them. I'm just, I'm not interested, I don't need it for what I do. Um, but it's a little, you know, and I think it's a good challenge for, for all of us 
I don't even use a Cintiq. I don't draw on a, on a whatever the, you know, a notebook or anything. I do use, I use a Wacom and I use that when I'm coloring because I use, I like to use my hand, but I don't have a Cintiq or anything like that. I just, I don't like drawing on glass. I like drawing on paper. And that, it feels different to me. And I know that it's amazing. And some of my contemporaries, my best people that I revere are masterful at it. I just, I'm just afraid of getting one more thing that gets in my way. This, the methods I use seem to work okay. <clears throat> Long answer, sorry, again. No, oh, thank you. Uh, you've given me a good perspective on how to keep my work unique and differentiate it from the crowd. So thank you. You're very welcome. All right, Hank, what do you think? Um, that's a, a great job with everybody today. Somebody thank else you. got a question here. Here's a question from an older okay. gentleman. All right, put it out there. <laughs> Craig, one, one thing about Craig's work, because I've known him for a few years, is that he gets it and it was so beautifully articulated by a French author back in the 40s, Anton saint Supery, where he said a designer, or it could be an architect or an artist, knows he's finished, not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Righto. That's the gentleman, by the way, that had the sign that said, you can't polish a horse turd. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by, both of those quotes. Thank you for that, Hall. Um, Craig, um, would you mind if some of these guys, if they have questions, contact you or reach out to you? Absolutely, yeah, send me an email. There you go. That works. And, yeah, so if you're working on something, and you want some advice, I mean, reach out to Craig and he'll give it. He actually worked, um, it was a while back, but worked with some of uh, Pippa's students, I remember, in when she was teaching a class and uh, you helped yeah. one particular student, I can't remember her name, but- um, uh, Jacqueline. Yeah, work on uh, a conceptual sort of thing she was working on. Happy to. Um, as always, you've made me feel welcome. It's so lovely to be in Atlanta and, and in New York. Where, where am I? Where's everybody? I'm just curious. I know Atlanta. somebody in Atlanta. Miami. Are you? Sri Lanka. New York. New York? Sri Lanka. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. Um, this is always a pleasure. I will be happy to come back and continue this conversation. Um, and if any of you have questions, if something that I've just overlooked, if something is, you know, something has been fuzzy in my presentation, which it likely is, um, please let me know and allow me to clarify it for you. Um, I hope I can help move the dial by 1% for all of you. Thank you so much. Until the next time. Thank you. So long. Thank Hank, you. I'll catch up with you. <laughs>